And welcome to Tales from the Infrared. We've switched up our our <laughs> where we where we're playing. Welcome to the first Tales from the Infrared Google Hangout. I am Jim Kelvarn. Christian is a little late, so let's jump right in. And with me this week is Dean Esme. How you doing, Dean? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. I've had a long couple of days dealing with the uh, Balrog, but uh, otherwise it's been... I'm most happy to be here and ready to talk about something geeky and nerdy. Well, hopefully you uh, took down that Balrog in the way it deserved. Also is Nefanor of Frawl. How you doing, Nefanor? Take me to your probe station. No, thanks. And, of course, we have Rachel Edwards, the honey badger. Hi, how are you? Doing pretty good. <laughs> and Christian Shearson is currently lost somewhere in the infrared. We don't know where. Somewhere in the vicinity of Beetlejuice. Yes, somewhere we've, got, we've got the beacon out for him. Hopefully he'll get in here soon. And, Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice. and running the back room, as always... The man, the myth, the legend, James Huff. Hello, folks. So, who is running the topics this week? Not it. Well, I believe you are. You lost the toss. You failed the roll. Yeah, you oh, lost the toss. We were toss. gonna make you. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, it's first I've heard about it. All right. Mm. You want me to so, do it? I'll do it. No, I'll I got it. it. I've got it open. So, uh, this week, find out Robotech, the hit TV show, uh, the hit TV show from the from the mid '80s, has finally, finally, gotten a uh, producer. And will be coming live action to the big screens. U.S. based Robotech storylines, which were influenced by but quite different from the original Japanese stories, became popular enough that there is a long line of related projects, enough that some have since been relegated to non continuity status. For years, various producers and writers have worked to make a live action movie in the U.S. Now, Warner. A Warner Brothers-based crew is trying again. Deadline reports that ho producers at Hollywood Gang with Gianni Nunari and Mark Canton producing have set Michael Gordon, 300 and G.I. Joe Rise of Cobra, to script a live-action Robotech film. Reportedly, the producers want Eddie, Andy Muschietti from Mama and possible Shadow of Colossus director to direct this film. In more fun news, Chris Pratt stays true to his words, visits sick kids in Boston with Chris Evans. From People article, Chris Pratt made good on his Super Bowl bet with fellow Marvel superhero Chris Evans when he stopped by Christopher's Haven in Boston on Friday to visit with sick children. If you need a refresher, Chris Pratt and Chris Evans bet each other that their favorite football team would take home the big win at the Super Bowl. Uh, Pratt was rooting for the Seahawks, and Evans was rooting for the Patriots. I hate both those teams. Uh, instead of betting money, the pair each agreed to visit a children's charity of the other superheroes' choice if they lost their bet. There were also side bets that accumulated about $27,000 for, for charities along the way. <sighs> we have Tech Raptor interviews Alistair Pinsoff. Over the past few days, Georgina Young has been posting an interview with Alistair Pinsoff, a writer and editor turned game developer who has previously worked for websites such as Destructoid, The Escapist, and The Escapist. Tech Raptor was lucky enough to talk to Alistair Pinsoff for a series of interviews about the current state of the gaming media. In the final part of the series, Alistair talks about the events leading up to him being fired from Destructoid and his thoughts on Gamergate. Related to that is Jason Schreier has decided to completely make himself out to be an idiot 
and say that the interview with Al- Alistair Pinsoff is totally off the rocker and that everything Pinsoff says is a lie. Though I have to say Sargon of Akkad does a great job of proving Schreier is an idiot. So much for ethics from Kotaku. Constantine, not among NBC announced renewals. DC's chain-smoking mage is coming up against a foe he might not be able to beat, NBC's executives. The show's future has remained in doubt since November of last year when NBC decided not to order a back half to Constantine's premiere season. NBC tried improving the show's odds by moving the second half of the season from 10 p.m. to 8 p.m. on Fridays, though they've yet to say if the experiment worked or failed. Expect final judgment on the series to come after the season finale on Friday, February 13th. Just how John Constantine would want it. And our Favorite pop culture con artist, I mean critic, is in the news again. Feminist Anita Sarkeesian named Harvard Humanist of the Year 2014. Feminist Frequency founder Anita Sarkeesian will receive the Harvard Humanist of the Year 2014 award on Sunday, February 8th at Harvard University Science Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Need we say more? We also have a link to the Eventbrite. So if anybody's in the bo- listening is in the area, you can still get tickets and go. That's all I'm going to say on that one. Coca-Cola suspends Make It Happy Twitter campaign after Gawker tricked it into quoting parts of Mein Kampf. Coca-Cola has forced has been forced to suspend its automated tweet make it happy campaign designed to transform mean tweets and negativity on the internet into cute images after it was tricked into quoting Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf ad week reports the campaign launched during the Super Bowl last weekend with a 60 second commercial focusing on the importance of injecting happiness into the internet according to a press release from the company And is gaming's, gaming a boys' club? The Anti-Defamation League has gone full Macintosh, literally. This organization has created a curriculum resource that leads back to Anita and Feminist Frequency trying to teach a high school class about sexism in gaming. In fact, almost all the resources come from Anita's work. This is the social justice feminist agenda, trying to brainwash kids into thinking that everything is sexism and misogyny. All this and more. Maybe even some Walking Dead. So, who wants to take what first? Just wanted to pop in and Uh, say, hi, I'm actually here. I'm finally here. It finally loaded. Sorry for being late. (laughs) Of course, we weren't playing Battlefield Hardline. You're dead to us. (laughs) Well, I thought, honestly, I thought it was Friday. (laughs) <laughs> I honestly thought it was Friday. I didn't know it was Saturday. Hey, uh, Christian, I got a suggestion. Calendar. Maybe even a watch. No. <laughs> okay, so, who wants to hit which topic first? Oh, God. I can't believe fucking Anita Sarkeesian is getting another award. Oh, there we go. Go for the shit first. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, Let's get the shit out of the way. Don't touch the poop. How the fuck did she manage to get Harvard Humanist of the Year when she dehumanizes an entire section of the population? Uh, Well, well, remember, it's not who you know, it's who you blow. Zoe proved us that. uh, Well, I mean, I think that's actually just a testament to how uh, corrupt the post-secondary education system has become in North America. Uh, They don't care about truth, in fact, and academics anymore. It's it's all about the church of emotionalism. Well, sadly, I think the uh, Anti-Defamation League course for teachers kind of proves what he's saying. I want to. I want to know who the other people were who were in the running because I'm pretty sure they actually did something of note, but or, or pos- at least possibly did something worthy of being nominated. 
uh, the Humanist of the Year Award, the Harvard Humanist of the Year Award for 2014. Well, the Shit. problem with it is the Harvard Humanist Society, I think that's what it was. Uh, oh, page not found. That's interesting. The game politics page that I had pulled up, pulled up is no longer there. But they had explained that, uh, yeah. They, ex no, they had explained... No, I got it up. Well, it's not working for me. Hmm. They'd explained that the Harvard Humanist Society... Uh, okay, hold on. Let's see. Yeah, Har Har the Humanist Community Harvard is a center well, for humanist life, a non-religious community committed to the power of human connection to help us do good and live well. Uh, no Harvard affiliation needed. Well, here's the thing, though. I mean, we do know that Jonathan McIntosh knows a lot of people in uh, in Massachusetts, Boston. Uh, from what I understand, I think he was actually raised in Massachusetts, and I think he actually went to college there as well. So that that would that would make sense. And whose strings? Who pulled the strings? Well, not only that, the Harvard group was founded in 1974 as a chaplaincy for humanist, atheist, and non-religious students at Harvard. And word has come out that. Anita is not an atheist. She actually has a religious denomination. Well, the thing about it is, is that that's that's something that you know needs to be looked into further. But the thing about it is, is that the she also goes out of her way to you know uh, to to say things, talk shit about the atheist community. She says, "Oh, I always find that it's always atheist men who seem to be the ones who contribute to my." Uh, what was it to 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 my abuse to the abuse that's being hurled at me? Oh my gosh! I don't under. I mean, that's the thing. It's something that she seems to actually be anti-atheist. I don't think she's just anti-atheist men. I think she is definitely anti-atheist. That she's got a, a thing against them because otherwise, why say anything about atheists at all? Well, my issue with all of this is, you know, you have, a, you have proof all over the internet that she is a con artist. You have proof all over the internet that she has created the problems for herself. You have proof all over the internet saying, you know, Anita Sarkeesian is doing this to herself and it raises the question, we don't have proof that she's doing it for the money, but it raises the question whether or not she's doing it specifically to make money. Well, I mean, half a million dollars in one year alone, that's how much she got. I think that's pretty conclusive evidence, if you ask me. Um, but the, the problem is, we no longer live in a society that cherishes fact in, over feeling. Um, like I said earlier, our post-secondary education system uh, is designed to instill the idea into young adults' minds that feelings are more important than facts. Do you think Anita Sarkeesian would have gotten away with this 15 or 20 years ago? I don't think so. Jack Thompson tried and he got slaughtered. Well, I will disagree but with Anita you. Anita does it today after all of the brainwashing in our colleges and universities and even with the facts in front of their faces, nobody wants to fess up to the truth and admit to it. I will disagree with you. Close their eyes, put their fingers in their ears and go, la, 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 la. I don't want to hear it. Anita Sarkeesian is such a revolutionary. She's a fucking con artist. And the entire fucking world is set up to buy into that bullshit. We've been conditioned to accept the lie. That's the problem. Okay, well, I will agree with the that we're condition. A lot of us have been conditioned to accept the lie. I will disagree that she wouldn't have gotten away with it twenty years ago. I honestly think that while it has gotten worse over the last twenty years, it, the fact that she is female, she and you know we're we're so wired as human beings to protect women. 
I think she still would have gotten away with it. However, I think it would have been harder to disprove her than it is now, but at the same time, it would have been harder for her to get her message out. It is a culmination of social media, a culmination of the internet. All of these things together have created the uh, situation that makes Anita what she is. Yeah, and without the internet also, you wouldn't have as much of the, the criticism, to be perfectly honest, because the internet has really changed the way that we distribute information to one another. I mean, if you, if you think about a time where you simply did not have the internet, you know, you actually had to go in and do the work. You had to try and find some source of information, like a college, a university, an expert, uh, for, for these specific things. So it would be difficult to disprove her, but also it would be difficult for her to distribute what she's doing. This is something she simply could not do without the internet. She couldn't put forth her fucking video series the way that she has without the internet. I don't know if it could have even happened... No, I mean, she's, a a, she's averaging two videos a year. Of course she could put out the videos at the exact same frequency, at least. Uh, Dean, you had something to say. Yeah, I'm actually pretty convinced she would not have made it over the hurdle of the mainstream media in the first place 20 years ago. I just don't think she would have. And I, as much as I think the media was bad back then and still sensationalistic, she would have been called out more. Um, I think we're seeing a real fracturing where you can create a very insular audience who doesn't want to hear dissenting views. And I, oddly enough, I think the Internet has made it easier to avoid hearing dissenting views rather than harder because, and we can all do this, and if you don't keep it, if you don't, if you don't, uh, what am I trying to say? If you don't go out of your way to allow yourself to be challenged, you can block out every dissenting point you ever don't like. It's, it's so easy to do that now. And she's figured out how to make a w living uh, by finding the audience that will do that for her. I don't think she could have done it in 1990 or even 2000. Well, That's remember, true. also she was part of that teleseminar success uh, thing. So she already had the knowledge. She already learned the knowledge on how to disseminate this kind of crap and get the con artistry out there. She is trained in this, literally. Yeah, she would have had to just done the talks straightforward and had to try to get people to pay her to do the talks because, you know, she wouldn't be able to really just easily distribute this kind of uh, these kinds of videos otherwise. I mean, how would she advertise herself in a world without the internet? Well, that's a good point. Uh, <laughs> like I said, though, it 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 the uh, she would have had a harder time in the nineties getting the information out. It's the culmination of social media, YouTube, all this together that has created it so that she could do it so effectively. But I don't think she would have had the same hard time that Jack Thompson got. And I don't think in the 90s she would have failed as spectacularly as Jack Thompson. I Personally, I think Dean is actually correct. Um... And I think it actually goes a little bit beyond that. Uh, not only has the internet uh, given us a way to turn off and tune out things that we don't want to hear, there's also um, there's also a uh, growing level of laziness. Uh, even even for, for the most part, even if we're willing to look at dissenting opinion, we just find it easier to turn it off than to try and dispute it. And that is true for most people. I'm just, I'm, I'm losing my mind at the thought that Anita has won Humanist of the Year Award. I mean, seriously, uh, humanist. Really. Uh, from she's Harvard. She's not a humanist. No, she's really not. And, I mean, this is Harvard. It's like... I understand academia is like ideological social justice warrior, ideological feminist territory, but my God, she has done nothing but, I mean, her videos are so vapid. 
I, I, I don't, I don't. I don't. Eh, someone else talk. I can't. Well, well, I hate. I hate to say this, but in if we really think about it, what has she really done to change the world outside of video games? You take that off of the table. What has she contributed to society? I'm pretty sure that there are probably people, other people who were nominated, that they thought of, who no, no, probably no, 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 have no. done work. What What has she contributed to video games? You know, within, what has she contributed to the sector she's trying to stick to? That too. Nothing. She's nothing. contributed nothing. She pitched one idea for a game that contradicts everything she fucking says in her goddamn videos anyways. It's a complete contradiction. She was like, this will be a great feminist game. But no, it's the same shit. It's, it's, it's a female character just like Lara Croft or... Or, or Bayonetta, who's kicking the crap out of male characters, and and it's the same fucking thing she's trying to fight against. She's contributed literally nothing to gaming. Except for a viewpoint that is skewed and horribly cherry-picked, and people fucking buy it up. And that's well, the culture we live in today because people don't want to fucking think. Well, I will disagree. Apparently, the Anti-Defamation League thinks she's contributed a lot because they've created a high school course on sexism in gaming for her, based upon her stuff. Yeah, but that's based in Common Core, and we all know that's a load of shit. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, I'm sorry. I didn't get a chance to read everything. Anti-Defamation League yes. has joined... Please, okay, I, 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 I was lost in the infrared myself. I faded out. I came back. You, you can't be telling me I just left and came back to a world in which the Anti-Defamation League is working with Sarkeesian on, on class courseware. Yes, in fact, I have Mr. Scruffles to thank for this. He, in, he showed me this last night, so thank you, Mr. Scruffles. Big shout out to him. And uh, yeah, Mr. If you Scruffles look, has to be making it up. This must no, be something from the. No, onion. it is real. It I, is real. I, I, no, you're all lying to me. Nope. You have to be making this up. Oh, Check the show notes, brother. Okay, excuse me. I'm just going to go shoot myself now. Goodbye. It was nice knowing you all. Yes, the Anti Defamation League has created a high school course for teaching kids about sexism in gaming. It, it's uh, the article I. I like Take a note, or take a moment, to write, read out the learning objectives. Number Go one, students will learn some background and facts and information about the cur uh, current state of video games. Yeah, her facts. Students will reflect upon their own experiences with gaming. Students will understand the role of women in video games and the specific ways in which sexism is perpetuated in the gaming world. Students will express their thoughts by writing a letter to a video game com uh, company. I want to point out something. This is actually a good thing. All the all the gamers out there, anybody from Gamergate, I would recommend you sit there and you start writing to the Anti Defamation League, and you start telling them how much of a con artist she is. You start telling, you start giving the proof that what she says is incorrect, and Try and get them to pull this down. I got a better idea. Contact the Anti-Defamation League. Let them know what kind of horrible anti-Islamic things uh, uh, Macintosh has been saying. I'm sure they'd love to be associated with that. Well, he, he also does uh, anti-Semitic and a few other things that are rather racist and sexist. But still, I mean, it, it just start pointing these things out to the Anti-Defamation League it'll be fun to watch them pull this. If there's also, one thing that's clear to me, it's that the years of pointing things out to supporters of Anita has gotten us nowhere. I had to let that sink in for a minute. I, I, I agree. Right. I gotta say that, you know, I vomited in my mouth a little the moment that, I, that someone mentioned that, uh, <laughs> fucking Anti-Defamation League and hopped on board with Anita Sarkeesian. I... Oh, Jesus Christ. But the thing about it is is that, yeah, you're right. 
pointing this stuff out doesn't work anymore because the people who are involved with this and I never thought that I would find myself saying this shit. Never in a million years would I would I ever think to say, oh, by the way, you know, the media is in bed with certain people and therefore they <laughs> with fucking Anita Sarkeesian. And that's why we can't get anything anything reported and any, any truth in, in all of this. It's completely want, glossed over. You wanna know what we need to do? <laughs> okay, and this is specifically as a gaming community, okay? Or as a nerd community, a geek community. There needs to be a schism, okay? We need to break off, form our own community, mm -hmm. and tell the rest of the social justice warriors to fuck off. They can have their shit all they fucking want, but we won't buy it. We'll make our own shit. We'll make our own sci-fi. We'll make our own games. We'll do our own thing, and we'll support developers who make games we like, not those who make games to push an agenda. And I, I think that the uh, free market <laughs> will ultimately move toward uh, what I would consider our side of the schism. Uh, because these people are going to end up screwing themselves over. They don't have the hardcore technical expertise required to be able to pull this off. No, they really don't. The best they got is Zoe Quinn's Depression Quest, which was written in Twine. By the way, you could do Depression Quest in Twine inside of a week. It doesn't take that long to make a game or a... The best they got is Revolution 60. Have you fucking seen that shit? No, what? What are you talking about? Okay, no. this is a game that was created by Brianna Wu. Oh, yeah. It looks like shit. <laughs> it's, and I've heard it's really, really clunky, and it took, a, I think it was like... Three years in development and like two hundred thousand dollars went into the fucking game. Revolution sixty quick time events. The uh, uh, I should have put it in the show notes maybe, but of course we didn't. Yeah, it went on. It went it, on to it, Steam. It, it's a, had a fantastic video on it that I should put into the uh, uh, show notes later. Skeptor, uh, one of our favorite new MRAs actually. Uh, he's Israeli. It's called More Video Game Misogyny. <laughs> it's an alert to the feminist frequency, and it's just screenshot after screenshot after screenshot condemning this new game, saying it's sexism, it's misogyny, it's sexualizing women, it's objectifying, it's glorifying women, and right at the end it goes, and the game was made by Brianna Wu. Oh, maybe it's not so bad. <laughs> it's very funny. I'll put a link in there somewhere. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I think it's time we move on to another topic because yes, talking about Anita Anita Sarkeesian, we're getting nowhere. Okay. Yeah, we're talking we circles. Been, we have been pointing out flaws in her logic. We have been pointing out her inexcusable use of other people's material without proper credit. Uh, we have been pointing all these things out for years, and we have gotten nowhere. So let's talk about... I got a better... I got to know what we can talk about. So I don't want to talk about Danita. In fact, when it comes to Anita, I say, nine, 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 nine! So we should talk about Coca-Cola. So, so you want to talk about Coke being tricked yes. by Gawker into... <laughs> mind comp? <laughs> Yeah, let's talk about that, because that actually, I am curious. Um, I did not hear about this. This this is the first time hearing about this. Okay, so let me explain wanna... what happened. Twitter, uh, Coke had this little bot. You send it a link uh, to a tweet that had uh, nasty words in it. They would take the words and make it into a cute little picture, an ASCII picture that they would send back to you. Say, hey, look, we made your tweet into something happy. And Gawker went and made a bot called Mine Coke and had it send Mein Kampf quotes to the bot. Okay, for what purpose, though? Why would they do this? Because it's Gawker. No, that, that, that doesn't make... Why, though? I mean, are they... This Gawker? Are they, are they no, trying no, 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 no. To, 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 to what effect? Yeah. To, to what effect? What, what was the result 
of... They got an article they could make out of it. Uh, what, what was the result, the, the technical result, when uh, cute pictures one bot... I'm confident. Okay. So Gawker used that to basically write a clickbait article all about this, and it's just like, really? Gawker, you sank so low that you had to make your own news. Well, I have two things on this. One, I want to jump on Gawker for say, for doing this because this is a level of unethical behavior that, well, we, we expect from Gawker, but we need to start pointing out that Gawker did this intentionally. They did this with the intent to fuck over Coke, fuck over what Coke wanted to do. And while I would give props to Coke for trying to do something good, I also want to jump on Coke for not for pulling this instead of fixing instead of fixing the code and fixing the problem. I mean, you know, you can you can only do so much and try to figure out what people try to think ahead of people so much. There's an old term in chess, you know, you try to think three moves ahead of your opponent, and if you're really good, you think five. But when you have people like the people at Gawker who are going to go out of their way to destroy something that somebody else does that's good for no other reason than to create so-called news... And I want, I would love to see a mainstream article point out that Gawker did this intentionally. Gawker did this. Gawker went out of their way to destroy something good. Okay, so let me let me get this straight. Gawker did this for no other reason than to get an article out of it. Probably. They they have they have nothing against the Coca Cola Corporation. Well, uh, I can't read minds, Christian. I can't say whether or not they do, or, but, but what? why? What is the purpose? Why? Like, are they that fucked in the head that they have to take something positive? And yes, there are a lot of mean tweets on Twitter. Some really mean tweets on Twitter, and you know, I I get with what Coca Cola was attempting. Why? Why? I have a theory. I have a theory. Please tell me. Please. I, now, uh, possi possibly just to be dicks because that, I mean, that's theory one. Theory two is that Coke may have been one of those people who quietly pulled their ads and didn't say anything and cost them some money. Just a theory. I have no proof. It's even a that, hypothesis. Not well, even you know, theory. either that either is entirely possible. Well, that you know, is also entirely possible. If they didn't pull their ads, they would have now. Yeah, and I think got... this may actually be Gawker's attempt at bullying uh, Coca-Cola into reinstating ads. They did it with Intel. Um, I don't see why they wouldn't go after Coca-Cola. Oh, yes, and to show you the duplicity, this is the quote from... Uh, Gawker editor Max Reed, you know, the same guy who said bring back bullying, quote, even when the text is shaped like a dog, it is disconcerting to see Coca-Cola, the soda company, urge its social media followers to safeguard the existence and reproduction of white racists. Yeah, after you guys did it, that's what we get. Well, see, here's the thing, and I want to point this out. Gawker did this. Gawker found a way to do this. I wouldn't be surprised if you look back in the feed that Coca, the Coca-Cola thing put out, if you didn't find several members of Gawker Media sending different tweets to it to figure out what it would do. Hmm. 
thing. They have demonstrated that there is no level of ethical squeeze they won't stoop to, short of maybe killing somebody. So I just wouldn't, I wouldn't put, put anything past, past them. them. Yeah. But this is something... Just, you guys realize the scope of this? It's not five or six tweets. They did 297 tweets. Uh, so basically what I said... You know, they, they were pinging at it to figure out how to do this. So this shows intent to do this. This is this is this is Gawker. I mean this is this shows what Gawker is like. And that, that shows that it isn't just one person at Gawker doing this. They had like a team of at least four or five people all pinging. Coke's uh, Make Happy Bot. Yes. Wow. This was wow. intentional. And this still, shows the intent. There are still oh. companies that advertise with Gawker, and this is the kind of shit they do? I, I think don't this want to live on this planet anymore. I don't want to live on this planet anymore. Fuck this planet. Right. Sorry, right. this is the quarantine zone. You're not leaving. <laughs> I'll make an old school geek reference, film geek reference. I'm, I'm thinking we're in like Citizen Kane territory, where the, the the people in charge. Well, I mean, it's a group of them, but still, they're acting collectively like Charles Foster Kane. That's what they're doing. That's how I'm seeing it. And if you don't get that reference, go see that movie because you need to see that movie anyway. Rosebud. That's not even the point of the film, but yes. <laughs> Oh, I know, but uh, I, it's a great film. I saw it when I was in high school. Yeah, I watch it again. There's more to it than you thought. But anyway, it's just like To Kill a Mockingbird. We all get assigned to read it when we're kids, and then as adults, we forget how good it really was. But anyway, you, you know that they're doing a uh, sequel to that finally. Oh, shut up! I shit you not. The author is actually finally doing a sequel to Kill a Mockingbird. Oh, oh, oh that. That I thought you meant Citizen Kane. Yeah, well, no, actually, no. It, no, To Kill a Mockingbird, actually, it's a weird story because I read up on it. Yes, it's a great book, and I wrote an essay on it, which pissed some people off, but uh, they couldn't refute anything it said. So, But um, uh, the actual story on that, I know this is a segue, but or, uh, not in the show notes, but Harper Lee has only ever published one book, To Kill a Mockingbird. She's never published anything else. It turns out... Uh, and, and one of the reasons she gave in one of her rare interviews is that you know her first book got a Pulitzer Prize and was one of the best-selling books of all time. She's like, I don't think I can I just I just don't think I can have a second act after that. And she never wrote again. But it turns out that before she wrote *A Kill a Mockingbird*, she had written a book that she thought she had that she thought wasn't worth publishing, and it was about most of the same characters but set in the 50s, in basically in what were contemporary times for her when she wrote it in the 50s and To Kill a Mockingbird and she set that aside and To Kill a Mockingbird was her next book where she explores the childhood and the younger days of these characters so it's it was written before To Kill a Mockingbird somebody found it, one of her lawyers found a copy of it and said why the hell don't we publish this so it was written before To Kill a Mockingbird but it kind of is a sequel um, should be interesting to see if it's any good <sighs> so kind of a weird story, well, anyway. Back, back to Coca-Cola. Gawker. <laughs> oh, like this. It's time Gawker goes under. You it know what? what I, I don't. I don't even know why this angers me so much because I'm a Pepsi fan. No, I can tell you. I've got I, a, I, have a, I have a theory as to why it makes you angry, and it's the same thing that makes me angry. Um, if you're the type of person who really wants to know truth from falsehood, uh, it infuriates you when somebody with that big a megaphone abuses their power and lies and slanders, and you know they're not honest, and there are tons of people believing you. It's infuriating. It's infuriating by its nature. Um, they're bullies. It, I mean, if they did this to... If they did this to... 
Oh, please forgive me because I don't want to keep talking about her, but if they did this to Anita Sarkeesian, I would be mad at them. You don't behave this way when you have this level of media power. You shouldn't. It's bullying and it's it's lying for money. With great Sorry, power right. comes great responsibility, and they're using the great power and not being responsible with it. Well, let, let's be honest here. Gawker, Gawker became as big as they are because of sensationalism and clickbait. Uh, they, they built their entire small media empire on clickbait and sensationalism and half-truths and even outright falsehoods. Uh, but as I said earlier during the Anita segment, uh, most people just fucking plug their ears and go la-la-la and they don't even fucking care anymore. They don't, they're too lazy to think. Sadly, this is true. Uh, we need to stop being so lazy as a, as the human race and start utilizing that lump that th that's three feet above our asses. I mean, Make shit, yourself we're, we're, we're only we're only something like maybe twenty years away from Zephram Cochran's first warp drive flight. If we don't get this shit fucking sorted, if we don't fucking stop with this social justice bullshit and fucking start working together, that's never going to fucking happen. We are never going to fucking reach Warp Drive. We are never going to make a fucking federation. We are never going to have Starfleet. Well, you know, oh. you remember, you're forgetting one thing. Between the time of now and uh, when Zephyr Kofkin had his first flight, we have to go through a world war. Um, something else I want to point out. You know, you say we're 20 years away from Zephyr Cochran. We're also 20 years from another Dark Age. I mean, if you really think about it. Yeah, that's coming. Yeah, if you really think about it and you look at the way things are going, we are 20 years from another Dark Age. Yeah, if we the keep difference is, going in religion, that direction. Instead of religion stifling truth, uh, it's going to be fucking social justice warriors and feminists. Yes. And I, I, I can't speak for anybody else on the panel, but I think all of us are here trying to keep us away from the from the second dark age. We're trying to move towards the better future, towards Zephyr and Cochran. Speak for yourself. I'm just sitting back and watching. Yeah, shut up, you damn dirty alien. But I think that also is a great move in to Robotech and the Robotech live-action movie that Warner Brothers wants to put out. Anybody want to throw in your thoughts before I totally dismantle everything? I, I have a thought, and, 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 and you're going to hate me for this thought, but I stopped watching kids' cartoons when this came out, so tell me what Robotech is. Robotech is a culmination of three Japanese, three totally unrelated Japanese animes that got mashed together into a storyline with U.S. Um, U.S. music in the background. It was it was groundbreaking. In it was a children's TV show where some of the main characters died. Where um, you know you had you actually had a romance that build it showed real actual relationship type thing it showed unrequited love between Rick Hunter and uh, uh, Minmay Min yeah Minmay yeah it showed um, the building of a relationship it showed the loss of love. It showed so much. It was just a good human drama for the ages, for lack of a better way of putting it. And it was aimed at kids. And it was aimed at kids. It, I, I, I don't know how to explain it beyond, uh, you know, go watch it if you get a chance. It, it was prolific. It was only 85 episodes, but it's, it was run five days a week every day for almost a decade 
on, on uh, right. regular TV, and it was brought back onto Toonami for a couple of se- couple of seasons. I mean, it 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 is phenomenal, and of course, it had giant mecha fighting uh, giant space aliens, which is always good. Which is always oh, good. good. Zentradi! Zentradi, the Robotech Masters, and the Invid. Oh, God, the Invid saga was awesome. I preferred Macross, but hey. There was, now, a, uh, there was a time when this sort of thing was common. I mean, I'll just get on myself up real quick and, and then stop. You still see the same thing happening with certain other things, but there was a show called Battle of the Planets that I was in love with. Um, when I was yeah, I remember in, that one. in the 70s, yeah, and uh, that they did the same thing. They actually chopped up the Japanese show and practically, practically rewrote it just using the, the the you know the animation footage, but the sound and the storylines were a complete rewrite, so it was its own unique thing. Um, but only this time, you're telling me they'd use more than one more than one cartoon. Like I know they do that too now. Here, I found out that when they do uh, um, oh my god, I'm feeling stupid. What <laughs> the creatures? Pokemon, Pokemon. It turns out that when they do Pokemon over here, they also recut them and completely rewrite the storylines. Uh, but you're telling me that the only the big thing with Robotech was it was actually more than one cartoon and they meshed them together. Yes, and they did yes. a good job of it too. Yes. So it's really a very American thing. Yes. Just because somebody made a pastiche of this Japanese thing. And then totally wrote their own thing using it. That's that's kind of cool, actually. Yeah, and it created a cult following in comics, books, even fan sites that to this day are still around. It had a great toy line. I actually have some of the toy toys uh, stashed away somewhere. But it created a role playing game, which Palladium Games did a really bad job of. But you know, I'm not going to go there. <clears throat> the thing with it is, as a huge, huge Robotech fan, I can say that you cannot do this in a single movie. Are they, they remaking it as live action? Or they they're they're it? remaking it live action and putting it out as a movie. You cannot do. You cannot do it as a single movie. The Macross Saga alone, which was the majority of well, it's the minority when you put it all together, but it was 36 episodes. But if you look at it... Yeah, I've even cannot, heard of the Macross saga. Yeah, If you look at it, you cannot do Macross, the Macross portion of it in less than five movies. Yeah, but they might just take... They might just take, like, one of the sagas. Like, I've never seen Robotech, the show... So, I'm sort of speaking as an outsider here. Uh, they might just take one of the sagas and just make one movie out of it, and that's it, and not even you touch on any of the other sagas. You can't. Of course you can. You can. You. No, like, you cannot. No, I'm can. serious. If, if it's like a two and a half to a three hour film, you could pack a lot of content in there. Uh, they'd have to chop off some of the scenes. They would have to uh, distill it down so that. You know, each you know maybe have three to, to five dumb it down. Times would be like one episode. Yeah, it would it would definitely be dumbed down from the original TV show, but they could do it. Uh, Christian, I will completely disagree with you there, and here's why. In in Macross alone, you have from the beginning the create the arrival of the SDF-1 on Earth, you have the attack of the Zentradi, you have the space fold of the SDF-1 and Macross Island to the far, to the other side of Pluto. You have a war fought f- between the SDF-1 and the survivors versus the Zentradi okay, all the okay, way... Jim. Jim, I get it. There's a lot, okay? There's a lot, but we don't know how many liberties they're going to be willing to take, and they don't. We don't know how much they're going to be willing to cut out and just ignore for the purposes, for the purposes of, the of the movie. One word, Jim: Hollywood. 
Yes. I'm well aware of this, but the point I'm trying to make is you will not do this justice if you do it, if you do chop it up too much. One word, it, Hollywood. They're, I, yes. they're not they're not they're not in the business of, of doing the original show justice. They're in the business to make a movie that will sell. They're okay. not doing it. Okay, hold on a second. Let me point. Two words. Let, let me explain why I say this. Let me explain why I say this. Okay, if if I may, without interruption. There is so much going on in the Macross saga alone. Even if you did chop it down to a single three-hour movie, you would cut out ninety. Five percent of what makes it good. You cannot do it in a in, in a three-hour movie. You cannot do it. What I was saying is, you can't. It would take five movies to make it worth it, to make it profitable. Not to mention, you would have five movies that are profitable. You, you would not only create have the fan service there, but you would also make new fans of this by expanding it to five movies. But I don't think Warner Brothers is willing to go that far. There is no way to do Macross justice in less than five movies. Do, may, may I try to cut the Scordian knot? Go for I, it. I, 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 they can absolutely do it. The issue is, uh, according to Jim, and Jim would know better than us, it will probably suck. It will probably not do it justice. But here's the thing: this is not the first. Done. This isn't the first time Hollywood has taken many liberties and cut out huge chunks of content from an original story in order to just do it in one film, without any care to to what the the fans think. Uh, oh, after the, the last Airbender. Time. Last Airbender. You know what the best example is? Is uh, Starship Troopers. And I could give I, you a few more. I but what I mean, you could look at and, Double and Dragon, and Street you. Fighter. And I get you, Jim. I get you. I and I agree. If they only do it in one movie, if they don't take the time and actually include all of the 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 very very important and and even the uh, not. You know, little important details about the story. If they don't do that, they won't do it justice, and the movie is going to suck, and the original fans are going to notice that they fucked up. But the main population of people, the casual audience, will still watch it, and they'll still enjoy it for its action. They'll still enjoy it for its distilled and watered down story they're not going to care well I understand that and, and I, I fully understand that and I know that it probably will happen that way the problem with it is is literally there is so much even if you do water it down to the point that people to a Pacific Rim level it's going to be a Michael Bay. Even pulling a Michael Bay, you couldn't make it popular enough. Seriously. Well, actually, a prime example, actually, uh, it, recently, with a movie that's not even out yet, it's the World of Warcraft movie that's being done by Legendary Pictures. Okay. Um, uh, the World of Warcraft movie is going to focus on the original war between the orcs and the humans. Um, so, of course, there's not really going to be any Draenei because Draenei weren't around then. Uh, it's going to focus on, I think, Uther. Now, that original war has a lot of lore. They're not going to be able to do it in one whole movie and do it complete justice. It's like doing it's like doing a movie about uh, Arth uh, Arthas 
and his rise to uh, to power, uh, how he became the Lich King, um, going to Northrend, reforging Frostmourne. How he breaking news! <laughs> oh, we got breaking news! We got breaking news! Who's gonna take us through the breaking news? Nefinor. Speaking speaking of robots, BattleBots is returning this summer on ABC. Rachel, tell us all about it. Rachel, did we lose Rachel? Hi, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Yeah, oh, oh my god, BattleBots is back! Holy shit! I fucking missed it so much. You know because. Soon, soon the robot carnage will be upon us once more. I, I get choked up just just thinking about it. I mean, come on, did, did any did any of you guys used to watch that stuff when it was on uh, Comedy Central and stuff like that? Um, you know, fuck yes, yeah, Ro I robots beating the shit bots. out of each other. Oh my god, just metal, metal and sparks. And you do it's realize, like, Rachel, uh, that I went to college to be a robotics programmer, so of course I watched it. Oh, we're totally gonna get out. This is great. <laughs> this is like it was like watching professional wrestling with robots. <laughs> Only it was real. And the drama, there was drama and everything. They were like, we don't like. They would talk about how the bot, the robot, was broken like last season, and how it might pull forward and and, and pull through with a victory this this time because it's going strong. <laughs> I, in case anybody doesn't know, this was real. This is real, okay? People would actually build remote controlled robots of their own design and in their own making, typically in their basements or their garages or whatever, and then put them into a ring. Well, I think it was square, wasn't it? No matter. Basically, what amounts to a wrestling ring. And these robots would smash the shit out of each other. And, you know, the robot that survived won, and the team that, that built that robot won. It was awesome. I think I remember my favorite one, because they could bring anything, right? I mean, th theoretically, I think they could even fly. I don't know if anybody ever tried that one, but, I mean, they could be on wheels. They could be on legs. They could be used uh, spinning blades. They could be used. My, my favorite one used to look kind of like a shoebox, and it just had, like, a spiked hammer in front that would just slam oh, down on its one. opponents. Well, the yeah. impaler? Yeah, I think that's what it was called. Yeah, that sounds well, like that that cool. I liked Mauler. I liked Mauler. It had fucking maces on it and spun around and shit. Just no, no, that that spiked. That that spike on that arm had had a lot of power. I mean, I I I remember seeing matches where it literally took less than ten seconds for it to win because it just it just smashed that spike down into the electronics through like any PCBs. That would have been, you know, controlling um, uh, uh, rotors and that, and just completely destroy the other team's ability to control their bot. And there'd be obstacles and stuff um, where, where where things would where there'd be like um, you know blades and stuff would come up and things would whack at it and. I'm <laughs> It was so fucking cool. <laughs> I think I think Vlad the Impaler, the one with that spiked hammer, did eventually get taken out, and I think it was one with a spinny kind of blade thing. No, 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 Vlad the, Vlad the no, Vlad the Impaler uh, was only um, was mostly a shoebox, and, and it had sort of a hammer thing that came down. It didn't have any any uh, blades that I that I can. Remember. No, I think it was eventually taken out by. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I might have. I might think it was eventually taken. Like somebody looked at it and said, "All right, well, try and get your spinny blade. Pa you know, try, try and get your." You're impaled past this bitch. It's this spinning <laughs> propeller. That is, bam! And the cool thing is that the cool thing is that um, there are at least three of the people at MythBusters who actually built robots in competition and were part of this. So before MythBusters was even a thing, they had they had robots. It, we, you had Grant Imahara and you had um, Jimmy Heineman and Adam Savage, who had a robot as well. I did not know that. Really? Yeah, well, big, now you know. I'm kind of a big fan of the Mythbusters guys. Well, <laughs> shit, I got to meet Grant at uh, the latest con, so I'm... Oh, yeah, he did uh, Dead Blow was his robot, and mm -hmm. his was the one that had the hammer. Oh, cool. Oh, cool. There was also, there was also there was a, couple, there was a couple of others that I remember, uh, like Mouse or Mecha Catbot. <laughs> 
So so that's oh, returning. So that's returning. Yes. yes. Oh, Fuck yeah. Awesome. Do we know? Do we know if the format's going to change at all, or is it pretty? Um, I don't know. Uh, I have no idea. But we do know that they're 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 trying to bring it back, and hopefully, the cult following that it has will will give us more seasons. I would think, <laughs> God, hasn't it been like ten years? I can't believe I'm that old, but it's been well, like ten. Yes, years, Yes, it has right? been ten years. I used to stay up at late and watch thinking. this. When I was a kid, I, I, I want to know if I was never a kid. kid. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I was in my thirties and I would never miss it. But um, uh, I would actually think the robots can probably be better now. Yeah, the um, problem is the robotics has advanced. <laughs> Not just that, the new material that they can use for the uh, armor and such is going to be a lot better. <gasps> and uh, I will say this: this is something that I'm glad to see ABC doing because it is actually a male friendly show. It is something that guys love. Well, and especially I love it too. Geek men too. Especially geek men because it's robotics. It's engineering. Uh, it, you know, it's sure, you know, I guess the dude bros would be like, yeah, robots are like killing each other, man. That's awesome. Uh, but I mean, it's, it's mainly, it's, it's main focus is on the geek male uh, audience uh, because so, it's so, engineering. So, so, so why is it that Rachel was the one who was I love my the orgasm? <laughs> because you, you know, she's secretly a man. What? No, oh, is that what it is? That's not true. Uh, well, I haven't checked the front end. I usually probe her from behind because that's what she likes. <laughs> oh, good he's Lord, always that's... probing. <sighs> he's always probing. <laughs> well, it seems like he's always probing you, but hey. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I will. I will say I've caught a few episodes of BattleBots way in the past, and it's it's a lot of fun. I I enjoyed it. It kind of got resparked my interest in engineering at at a low point. So yeah, it'll be nice to see it, but it's not really something that gets me hot and wet like Rachel is. Hey. I, so this show is the reason why I actually bought Lego Mindstorms, which is the robotics Lego. And if it's coming back, I may have to get the new stuff, just because I want to build my own little Lego battle bot. You know oh that they God, still have might... those competitions, so right? I mean, they're, they still exist, and they've still been going on, even after they took battle bots off of the air. Um, they, they, these competitions have been going on for, for years now, and I think they've had a resurgence within the last couple of years, which is why they're bringing the show back. But, yeah. I see now from this little write-up that uh, um, they're going to spend more time talking about the robots' designs and the creators' backstories, and there's going to be no weight classes. No! You mean? <laughs> I mean, you put whatever you want in there, baby. Whether it's, you know, 5 pounds or 5,000, you bring Iron it. butts. Shit, I man. Wait, 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 we get into legal trouble. No more than eight seconds. That's the rule. Um, but, yeah, um, I, I, I'm sitting here wondering how does that work, right? Because somebody got to... Well, I mean, it just it changes your whole design mentality, doesn't it? Like, because i got to think about weight, but then you really don't know what you're going to be fighting, right? You, you gotta, they must have some parameters. They've got to have some parameters. Because, I mean, really, I could just build, like, a fucking... I could get a, 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 a lawn tracker... And just put it on remote control and say, I'm just going to roll over anything that, you know, take yeah. a little. Uh, there's got to be some kind of limit, but they're saying no weight class. Yeah, there the, must be other, other things they're doing. The odd thing is that the flipper robots were the ones that often had a lot of success. But if you have the flipping mechanism and stuff, you don't have as much room to do anything else. Um, and that, that's really the problem. So a flipper robot going up against something like Vlad the Impaler would have a lot of problems because <laughs> how it um, it's just going to go there and and, pit and punch through the surface and fuck up its electronics before it can flip it. But yeah. See, when things have gotten really dorky and off track. <laughs> no, they haven't. Okay. No, they haven't. <laughs> okay, you know what? I'm going to call this and say let's move on to the next one. <laughs> no, okay. robots! We must stay with the robots! No, actually, no, uh, we are we're at, actually we're at the top of the hour, so yeah, uh, we have one more hour to go, and we have what is it? We still have one, two, three, three 
four. possibly four topics to get through. Oh, so, is gaming more on a, surprise. a boys club? We've already covered that. Have we? When? Yeah, no, that, that was the Anti-Defamation League one. Oh, oh, oh yeah. We, wait, we talked about that at the same time we talked about Anita? Yep. Yes. Why, why because would we it was about Anita. Happens? Because Anita is saying gaming is a boys' club, and the Anti Defamation League is helping. Oh, jeez. Yeah, conference. it's helping. Right. It's 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 something. We should go to something fun, like Chris Pratt and uh, the sick kids. Yeah, <laughs> like that. that's so sweet. I mean, really. Well, I I like the fact that you know you have Chris Pratt and Chris Evans, uh, two of the big stars for Marvel's movies lately. Mm-hmm. Basically, going okay. My team's gonna win. You know, it, it it is a little bit of the jock mentality of I'm better than you. You're I. It, you know, it's it's the whole dick measuring contest that uh, every jock does at one point. But it's still, it's it's the the way you use it, and I think this I think- is what makes it so good, is that they basically said you know. I'm rooting for my team. You're rooting for your team. We have this ability to do good while we do it. And they brought some joy. And what I found out is Chris Evans is still going to show up at Pratt's... uh, Pratt's... um, Choice uh, of Charity. uh, Choice of Charity as Captain America. So So even though he lost, he's still following through. Well, no, Pratt. Or sorry, lost. even though he won, he still. Uh, no, no, yeah, it, it, it was Pratt. It was Pratt who I think lost the bet, and he he came sh- showed up uh, dressed as uh, Star Lord. Star Lord, yeah. And yeah, he he had the jacket. I was surprised he had the jacket. Like no, he had the whole he pro- costume. Yeah, I was surprised he had he had uh, the jacket though, and the, the whole. Well, no, more than likely, him. Marvel said, "You know what? Do it," and they probably said, the damn costume. Costume. "Yeah." Uh, well, yeah, the jacket was pretty awesome. <laughs> we did the dance I too. Surprised if he sat there and said, "I want to keep the jacket." You know that that was a cool <laughs> jacket. But yeah, I I I have to agree with Nefanor. Marvel probably said, "Okay, this is great PR. Do it, both of you." Which you know you really can't tell these stars what they can and can't do. But the fact that Marvel's throwing its weight behind it and saying, "Hey, yeah, we fully support this," it's one of the things that has kept me happy with Marvel for a long period of time, in that Marvel does try to do good. Quite often. And they they try to bring joy to kids. And, you know, it's, it's Captain America and Star-Lord. Come on. How, how do you beat that? I don't think you can. Yeah, it was pretty awesome. And just seeing the pictures of them with the kids, I, those kids looked like they were just ready to cry from happiness. Yeah, I, 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 I can't, I can't uh, say anything, anything bad about this. I think this is pure win all the way around. Yeah. Well, he's not and, the first person to do it, though. Um, uh, what you call it? Robert Downey Jr. does this sort of thing a, a lot for sick kids. Anytime somebody asks, like, like and, and then of course, uh, Captain Jack Sparrow has shown up in weird locations. Yeah, but I mean, I think this is the first time you've ever ever seen the competition side of it. And, and I think the competition, it, it's, it's, it's what I call healthy competition. It's like, hey, you know, we're both rooting for our teams. Let's do something good out of this. Hey, look, masculinity in a positive light. It's almost like it's not evil. Oh, yeah. oh bite your tongue, you damn dirty alien. But, yeah, it's... It literally it shows the good side of masculinity, the good the good healthy side that people, people need, to, need see to see more of. That feminists are never talking about. Yeah. Echo, echo, crickets. Somebody, please take it. Is there somebody? Well, well, well what is well, it really to say? Uh, Chris well, Pratt I, and Chris I'll Evans made a bet, and it didn't really matter who won because they're both going to children's hospitals dressed up in in their costumes for their characters and making sick kids happy. 
Did now, wait a minute. What is the significance of this? I'll be honest. I'm bad with names. Who the fuck is Chris Pratt, and who the fuck is Chris Evans? Uh, Chris Pratt Chris is Pratt. Star-Lord. Chris Evans is Captain America from the recent movies. Okay, so okay, so it's just cool that they did this. Yeah, it's, okay. it's geek culture going and doing positive things. Okay, excellent. I love it. Cool. We need more of that. We need more of that. Well, I, I think we also should point out that it's two good men, you know, taking their competition and doing good in the world. And that's something everybody can do, but it it, it doesn't get enough press. It doesn't get enough... Um, it doesn't get get shown enough of the good that people can do for others. Which, you know... It, there's also the fact that Chris Pratt, Chris Evans, there were side bets among uh, some of their friends that ended up rating, raising over $27,000 for their, their respective charities. I mean, just think, think of that. Think of, this is, this is people doing good. This is people going out there, using their power, their fame, to do something to help others. That is good. And it's two men showing that, you know, we are good people doing this. And they're just using what they have. And I, I, I think this is something that should be brought to more people's attention. And yes, it's Captain America. I, I agree. Yeah, this is, this is actually. Oh, no, 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 it's Star Lord. No. Yeah, I hope we did the dance. I hope we did the dance. Like, hey, hey, what you talking about? You, you mean his pelvic sorcery? <laughs> yes, his pelvic sorcery. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's, that's great. <sighs> but we also have the Alistair Pinsoff interview, you guys. You know, oh, you know? God. Yeah, <laughs> you mean one word of that. I said All that right, once again, stolen. who the fuck is that? Who the fuck is that? Okay, Alistair Pinsoff was um, revealing a lot of uh, insider stuff going on uh, concerning corruption within games journalism and things like that. Um, and one of the and where he started to uh, to say, you know what, forget the shit, I'm, I'm getting out. Um, he was also the one who was blackballed by the Game Journal pros list because uh, mm -hmm. he dared do something that uh, his boss told him to. Mm -hmm. it, it just got really, really ridiculous with some of the stuff that he described happening. Uh, I think he, I think he asked about what was going. going sorry, ooh, I can hear myself. Phil Fish stealing yeah. Fez. Mm hmm. And, yeah, basically there was a lot of code that he simply didn't do and he, he took from somebody else and used in Fez. And I think it was also music that was uh, it was created for the game that he uh, basically had somebody else copy uh, and, and change just slightly for the game as well. And basically just fucked people over who had left the project. Well, and there's he, more than that. There's more than just that. Oh, there's, there's a ton also of stuff. <laughs> yeah, he also uh, reported on a crowdfunding for a female developer who said she she got into a car accident and there was shrapnel that she needed remo removed. What he found out when he did a little bit of research was she was doing it to get gender reassignment surgery, and he reported on that. And his um, his editors came down on him for telling the truth. Yeah, a lot of shit coming out of this. I mean, this is really talking about what uh, the general feeling is going on of what's what's going on really behind the doors um, of games journalism. What's really happening out there. What's what the industry really looks like. And it's it's one big mess. People are afraid to tell the truth, to come up against these people who are being corrupt because of what it could do to the reputations, how it will just completely uh, make it impossible for them to do anything within the industry. Because all you need to do is just offend one of these major power players and you are blacklisted. Well, I think it goes a little bit 
further than that, you have to remember these people who were who are power players are the ones who are saying we're oppressed. Mm -hmm. We are the oppressed minority. The problem with it is they've been given so much power and they abuse it so heavily. Yeah, there's a massive abuse of power. Yeah, and this this is what it I I pointed out is you know, the LGBT community got on him for reporting that, you know, she was lying. Mm -hmm. They weren't saying, hey, you know, you know, we we disavow her her methods. It, it was, no, we, you should be supporting this person for doing this. No, you should be calling this person out for lying about what they're doing. Yeah. And I... that's, the, I, that's the thing a lot of people forget, is that these power players are ut utilizing, these so-called underprivileged class, are utilizing this power they have to make you seem like you're such a horrible human being for just saying something like, hey, look, this person's lying about why they're doing this. I, w I mean, if you actually look into some of this, it, it's, it's, it's rife with people just being dishonest and uh, utilizing, utilizing other people to get what they want. Mm. I mean... It's it's an abuse of power. And, so wait, let me get this straight. There's corruption in the areas where the social justice warriors and feminists have lo a lot of sway. No, yeah, I know it's breaking news, right, Nevinor? Hmm. And the the problem really comes in is the moment you try to talk about this, you know, like uh, and express this as a serious issue to any normal person outside of Gamergate or or this conversation, they say, well, this simply isn't important because it, what does it really matter in the scheme of things? If you think that this is bad, think about the corruption that is likely happening, in, and you probably can easily find going on in mainstream media. And in, when you when you say that, they'll say, "Oh, well, you, whatever. You know, the media is corrupt. You know, news at eleven. That's not that's not a big deal. That's that's something that's already there. What are you going to really do to change it? So just why bother?" That's that's the line of thinking that these people have, and that's why things are so fucking horrible in the media because people have such apathy about this, about the media. They're like, oh, the media is corrupt, whatever. They don't really care. Yeah, the level of apathy in society. I I, I I'm gonna go back to something Christian said. We've gotten really lazy in our guarding of our rights and our freedoms. I think it's we've become lazy and apathetic, and we need, in order to fi truly fix things and make things better, we need to shake off that laziness, shake off that apathy, and start guarding against corruption, guarding against these types of things, and saying, hey, look, this isn't right. Well, it goes beyond laziness here because when you say, okay, the media, these me different media sources have a massive slant to them, they'll say, you know, so what? Because these people benefit directly from this information being slanted. They benefit directly from a slant in media, from, from biased media sources because it gives people misinformation and sways them to their side. And that's, that's so fucking ridiculous. It, it's it's I, what's it most important is that people have accurate information so that they can have an accurate view of what's happening in the world. You know, I agree. actually, going back to the whole uh, apathy thing, there's a movie that comes to mind whenever I hear about the apathy of the general person, and I'm just going to do a little quote from it now. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody out there is out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. Banks are going bust. Shopkeepers keep a gun under their counter. Punks are running wild in the street, and there's nothing anywhere anyone seems to know what to do. And there's no end to it. We know the air is unfit to breathe. Our food is unfit to eat. And we sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that there's 15 homicides and 63 violent climbs as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad. Worse than bad. They're crazy. 
It's like everywhere everyone is going crazy, and so we don't go out anymore. We sit in our homes, and slowly the world and we are living in gets smaller. And all we say is, please, let us uh, leave us alone in our living rooms. Let us have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios, and I won't see anything. Just leave me alone. Well, I'm not going to leave you alone. I want you to get mad. I don't want you to protest. I don't want you to riot. I don't want you to write your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't, I don't know what to do about the depression and inflation and the Russians and the crime in the streets. All I know is that you've got to get mad. You've got to say, I'm a human being, goddammit. My life has value. Well, I think there's another quote that works just as well from a different movie. And I want to point this one out. People need dramatic examples to shake them out of apathy. And I can't do that as Bruce Wayne. As a man, I'm flesh and blood. I can be ignored. I can be destroyed. But as a symbol, as a symbol, I can be incorruptible. I can be everlasting. And then we could always go into V. <laughs> Which version? The, the movie version, we could always do the, uh, you know, Gamergate. We are that symbol. We are the idea that is bulletproof. <laughs> but, but that's the thing, though, is that people are so readily just willing to give up the concept of an unbiased source of information. They're so readily willing to give it up to benefit them politically. And, and that's just... I, I don't even know what to say to that. You're willing to have lies take over reality in order to just benefit in, in a way that is short term. Well, it goes back to something I've been saying for a while. A lot of our thinking in the last few decades has been very short term, very what's in it for me right now. And if you look at how things have turned out, Oftentimes, the short-term gain is a long-term loss. Exactly. Uh, I can point to the housing bubble. I can point to any one of a number of things beyond that. It might take me a bit to come up with other examples, but the housing bubble is the most uh, prominent in my mind because it's been re it's recent. Student loan bubble I, is coming real fast. Say again. Student loan bubble coming very very fast. Yeah, yeah. everybody I mean, is ha, has at least I think I think they said that the average amount of student loan debt in the United States is at least thirty thousand dollars, or I think it was something no, or twenty five thousand dollars. That's that is um, that is the minimum amount that or the average amount that every student in the United States has in student loan debt, and and that is a, that doesn't may not seem like a lot, but if you think about it. That is, uh, you take about, you double that amount and you could probably get a small home. But probably not for long because that is increasing as well. <laughs> yeah, well, the, the thing with it is, is this, this, these bubbles that we create, these short-term sell, the, sell bad loans to cover, or sell, sell loans and packages to cover the bad loans, it creates the problem. And people and won't talk about it. People won't talk about it because if they had any idea of how much they are getting fucked every single day of their lives, they would just go into a rage and revolt. But, yes. you know, that's another way that people benefit from slanted news that gives misinformation and doesn't tell people just how much they're getting boned. Yeah. <laughs> but that's okay because some people like Rachel like that. I'm saying if, if people are so mixed up in the constant left versus right bullshit, they don't understand what is really taking place. It's always an us versus them mentality that fucks everyone. And, you know, I, I always comment on that because if you look at the fact... I'm just going to take this back to uh, men's rights and uh, feminism. Uh, it is an us versus them, and if you look at feminism, it started with upper middle class women attacking men so the rich stirring the pot between the genders y yeah, and, yeah and oh geez sorry I'm echoing on your end but w we get back to the Alistair Pinsoff stuff I mean y you see him facing such a pushback from things that are just you know just something in, in games media 
like, like this. Just this minor thing is just being an honest journalist. And, and that's what you, you start to understand, that just being a, a journalist in, in the proper way is enough to get you to lose your job these days. So what you're saying is doing the right thing is no longer a good thing. Exactly. We're, we're living in a world where people would rather be lied to than receive accurate information. And, and you see that because now people are becoming more interested in stuff that would usually belong on a gossip kind of channel, you know, a gossip television show. That's leaking into our media, into these 24-hour news broadcasts. Stuff about, like, fucking Justin Bieber. I don't give a shit. Tell me more about the fucking Middle East. Okay? <laughs> Tell me what's actually going on. These people who are being murdered by ISIS and shit like that. I, I don't give a shit about Justin Bieber or, or whatever fucking celebrity is popular right now. That doesn't fucking matter. Yeah, did you know that Jennifer Lawrence actually posed nude with a snake for Vanity Fair? Uh, oh, where can I find the link to that? Exactly, and we, uh, we uh, actively participate in into this shit. We actively participate in this bullshit. This is why Wait, I think... It's happening too? Way. I'm saying we actively participate in this by becoming interested more in this drama bullshit than in being informed citizens. And this is what's bringing down society, in my opinion, is that we're not actively trying to create what would be better for everyone. We're just going after what's best for ourselves and looking at what distracts us from the pain of our daily lives. But, but yeah, that's that's why, why Gamer Gate is really a thing, because if we can't solve something, as minor as games journalism... What hope do we have of reforming the media? The corrupt media that has gotten bloated on its own bullshit. Just saying. And, and uh, now I think, I think we should probably it's move time on. time for a revolution. We should probably move on. That's why I say... I was going to say, that's, that's kind of depressing. Right sorry. I'm sorry. It's time for a revolution, or it's time we just say fuck it and drink the Kool-Aid. I can't drink the Kool-Aid. You no, can't. I'm allergic. You can't go back. <laughs> I'm sorry, man. I'm not plugging myself back in. Yeah, I, I, I spent too long in the Matrix myself. I, uh, I, I can't go back. You and me both, that's buddy. What, that's what really sucks, man. Once you've had something empirically demonstrated to you, it take. I mean, I, I don't, I don't believe I could do it if I tried. I mean, there's too much information. There's too much fact. There's just too much. But I, there is a there is this theory. If you want me to go off on it, well, I will anyway, even if you don't want me to. Please do. Of the Jungian archetypes. Ooh, okay. So this is going all the way back to Carl Jung, and and one of his ideas is that there is basically the extroverted and introverted arc, uh, per personality type. Um, now, extrovert is easily mistaken for somebody who is very outgoing, whereas an introvert is mistaken for somebody who's shy and not outgoing. But that's not what he's talking about. He, when he's talking about this, it's 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 he's actually talking about how people process their information and process the world. Basically, how they interact with the world and how they interact with information. And introverts look for the information first and then uh, try to figure out what to do with it or how to integrate it into their um, into their world view. Um, so they look for data first. Extroverts look to other people first for what the right thing to think is. And then they go from there. And what will frighten you is that study suggests the majority of the population are extrovert and look to other people first and foremost to tell them what's true and not true. I was actually just going to say that the majority of the population are extroverted, which means introverts like myself are a minority and... It's very, it's a very, very scary thought to know that the majority of the population are just it, trying to please others. To so fit in. basically, uh, majority of the population have, is cheap. Well, no, I was going to say basically you have the minority of the population are scientists and the majority are sheep, and there are more of them than us. And that's nice. kind of will give you nightmares. Yeah, but that uh, also works to our advantage because they are sheep, so we can lead them. 
It's true. I know, but it means you have to manipulate them, which means you have to become like them. Oh, it's horrible. That's all. I'm just saying. Well, that's that's the basis for pickup artistry, is manipulation. I know. It's the basis of a whole lot of things. It's the basis of marketing. Basis it's of the Yes, but in the truth, the, the whole scheme of things, the idea that we can actually start to control the narrative, that's not so bad. <laughs> but this is, this is really why there's such a problem in getting the information that people are revealing in Gamergate to the general populace because these people, you know, they are the gatekeepers of information, okay? If they decide that this is the narrative that we're going to push and we're going to continue to push this, this particular narrative and only say things in this way, then most of the population are completely oblivious to the truth. Schism. I said it earlier and I'm going to say it again. We need a schism. We need to say fuck their group. Honestly, fuck their I think... Subculture. Fuck whatever the hell they're trying to do with their Gawker media and their Gama Sutra and their Destructoid and their Kotaku. Fuck them. We do our own thing. Uh, honestly, well, I think that there needs to be more independent news sources, but the problem is how do you, how are you going to be able to then send people out into the field, you know, and, and fund journalists doing uh, journalistic work in these in independent things? Eventually, they have Patreon. to... I know, but it's the thing like about it is, is, I I started a Patreon. I still haven't finished setting it up, but I started a Patreon. Um, we could do that, and we. But could eventually, ask you have to get in bed with other people. To well, no, you don't. You really don't. You don't have to get in bed with anybody. That's uh, the whole purpose mean, of Patreon. The whole purpose of Patreon is that your followers, your viewers, your readers, they can contribute uh, a monthly amount. They could pledge a monthly amount, amount to help you financially while you do your thing. And you don't have to get in bed with anybody. Rachel, Rachel, you, you mean uh, independent news sources like 20 Ounce? No, I'm talking about in general, like regular, regular news. I'm yeah, talking but about not he was trying to plug it. Rachel. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Come on, 20 ounce, 20 ounce. 20 ounce. I know. What's 20 ounce? What's 20 ounce? Tell 20. me what. Tell me more about 20 ounce. 20 ounce.com <laughs> is a uh, gaming community review slash podcast community website that uh, myself, Nefinor, Rachel, Jim, as well as um, a friend of ours in Serbia named Praetorian. His name is Alexander Katsuni, uh, who is also lives here in Canada. Uh, I bleed V2O. His name is Sam. He lives in the United States. Uh, we all started this together. We also brought in Schultz Brigade um, to uh, to be a podcaster as well as a writer for us. Uh, and we are starting our own gaming community website. In fact, we've already started it. We have content up. It's 20oz.com. That's the URL. You could check it out. If you want to, we do a lot of podcasts. We recently did an interview with John Gibson, the CEO and president of Tripwire Interactive, about his upcoming game, Killing Floor 2. We are planning to do an another interview with him soon. Uh, in And in this interview, we'll actually take community questions. So we're, we're planning on putting up a sticky thread on the Tripwire forums, asking his community, and really anybody else who wants to stop by, to post their questions, and we will ask them live on the interview. Well, it might it might be a live podcast. We might do it recorded. We still haven't figured that out yet. But we will ask the community questions during the interview. Well, that sounds awesome. So anyway, um, you know, the only there's only one thing I'll point out with the, the whole idea of independent media. Um, they still sometimes, the bigger they get, the dumber they get. Just to, you know, rain on your parade a little bit. I, I actually remember when the Young Turks actually seemed kind of cool and interesting and intelligent. Oh, you mean instead of, like, saying... Oh, the uh, Karen interview. The Karen yeah. interview. <laughs> oh, well, it's a change of subject, but, no, I mean, they really did start out as a completely independent YouTube, you know, online phenomenon, and they've had wild success, and it seems like every year they just get dumber and dumber and dumber. And yeah, they did have Karen it's on very, recently. Yeah, it's very Boy. social justice-y uh, these days. It's really, really ridiculous. It's very slanted. 
they're willing to attack what they call political correctness, but my God, they're nothing but political correctness. Yeah. And I also, I also really forgot to mention. Kind. I also forgot to mention Mr. Scruffles and Nils. We also brought them on for twenty ounce. Sorry, guys. Uh, I blanked. Anyway, yes. continue. And, uh, the, uh, but but maybe that's it. Maybe that's maybe it's just a way of things. I, I th- I'm positive at some point Gawker Media was like three people. Like we're going to take over the world and we're going to change anything because we don't like the current media establishment. And then they turn and they mutate and they become something ugly and hideous. Well, it's the Charles there, Foster Kane story. It probably is, happens to all everybody. There is an old saying. Power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts, absolutely. The problem with that theory is you need to have a conscience in there saying, this is not right. If you're going to be doing this kind of stuff, and you're going to take positions of power, you need to have a very strong conscience, conscience and a very strong sense of what is and isn't correct. In you also have to have all. You also have to have enough information. If you could understand how power corrupts, you can prevent it from corrupting you. Yes. And I think that would that be a would good be first a good step. step. Yeah. But I like the corruption. I like being corrupt. It's fun. Damn dirty alien. I think that would be a good first step is just figuring out how the power corrupts, how it uh, changes people over time, and maybe getting to a point where we say, okay, we're, I'm starting to get to this point, and I need to step away. Citizen Kane, I'm telling you, go watch it again. No, no, if you want to see how power can corrupt you, all you need to do is just talk to John Constantine. Nice segue. That is true. Nice segue. That is true. John Constantine. I gotta tell you honestly, uh, you guys, you guys are going to talk more. I've watched like four episodes so far, and it's not hooking me. So tell me what you see in this show. And I there, haven't even watched it at all. So it's I'm not. It's not Keanu Reeves. Well, there's actually <laughs> that's, that's, an, improvement. that's, it, that's it, an improvement. Yeah. Um, here's some things you you should know. Uh, the guy who plays Constantine is Constantine, and part of the reason why he is Constantine is he was at a pub with one of his friends, and he was like, you know, I've got a, I've got a, an audition for this part, and his friend was like, oh, what's the part? And he's like, well, it's just this comic book thing called uh, Constantine, and his friend happened to be a huge Constantine fan. I, I'm talking like uber fan, knew, knew the character almost as well as he knew himself, and he just drilled the the actor in how to be Constantine. He's like, you need a Zippo lighter, you need the trench coat, you need to know how to play with that Zippo lighter, you need to know all this, and if you can get this down, you will be... Uh, you you will be more successful than you could possibly imagine. And so back up and tell us who Constantine is, for God's sake. Okay, Constantine is the typical. I don't give a fuck about the world, even though I really do. He does what he does because he knows there's something wrong. He's an occult and, master. He's an he is well, pe- like he said in the first first episode. He's a petty dabbler. He should really get that changed. He hates to put on airs, but uh, yeah, he is one of the premier mages of the DC universe. He's also a chain smoker, and he's the type of person who makes you believe he can get the job done, but at the he's same so time, asshole. Yeah, but he he's a total asshole. He is literally the last option that you want to go for. He is... It, it, let, I, I, as I explained it to Dean once, if you have a choice between Constantine and Lex Luthor, you want to go with Luthor first. It's... He takes massive risks. He does things no one else will do. But he almost always gets the job done. And he makes you believe it can be done. Okay, and he's a mage, and he's he's cool. 
All right, so no, he's kind had, of a jerk. I said, well, all right, he's a cool jerk. The point is, okay, so and he's, he's got this show, and what you're telling me is the show is very faithful to the comic book, which, by the way, I've never read, which may explain why you like it so much, but it seems to be struggling in the ratings because they may not even be re- it may not even be renews. Renewed. It may still be renewed. The thing with it is, is Constantine. It, it, it like the article says, you know, Constantine wouldn't have it any other way. It's a last minute, down to the wire. He he could still pull it out, even though everything's going wrong. Uh, some episodes I would recommend you watch are the one with the angel, who just ca- who who fell to Earth um, after having a feather pulled from from her wing. That was an excellent episode. I think that was uh, Season 1, Episode 6. Then there's Season 1, Episode 9 and 10. And throughout the whole thing, um, you'll notice that they, they show little snippets. You, you get um, Dr. Fate's helmet. You get uh, some other... You, you get Jim Corrigan making an appearance. If anybody knows DC comic lore, that is the man who eventually becomes the Spectre. And the, it, you, you see a lot of this co- this happening throughout the show... And as a fanboy, I, I'm telling you, this it, it, it's it's great to see the service for the magic side of DC. But uh, yeah, it, you got to give it a few more episodes, Dean. Probably at least get it get through episode uh, ten. My question is: Has anybody else watched this show besides Jim and me? A few episodes. Uh oh. So I've been following it since the beginning. I, I love it. it. I haven't watched it yet. Yes, I've, I love it. It's so I've been dark. Watching Gotham. Okay, we got the echo back. Somebody fix that. But all right, love it, love it. Those of you who love it, tell us more. It, it's in a lot of ways, it is what dark supernatural should be. It is what supernatural the TV show should have been. It's dark. It's gritty. It's dirty. It is everything that a good supernatural show should be. It is absolutely, in some ways, vile, but at the same time showing you that this stuff is not something you want to be fucking with. It is t- primal forces that sh- nobody should be messing with. That is the impression I got from the show. In fact, what the show's been reminding me of in the first few episodes is it reminds me a lot of the show Supernatural, which I was a big fan of right until around season seven when it just started to go downhill more and more and more and more and more. And maybe that's part of why I'm not getting into it, because I'm like, okay, they already did this on Supernatural. Uh, There's Agents, there's Demons, there's Hell. Yeah, but they're not going to go downhill like Supernatural because they're already at the bottom. This is is looking at the (laughs) shit end of the Supernatural spectrum, and it's staying in the shit end. Okay, I'll buy it. And so, Rachel, what's your take on the show? I haven't watched it yet. <laughs> I know. Oh, I thought you were, I'm sorry, I thought you were raving. I thought you were the one saying you No, 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 I haven't seen it. I've been focusing more on uh, Gotham and Grimm lately. James was James. the one who had seen it and was oh, saying James. I love it. James. No, no, I didn't say I loved it. Uh, that was me. Go ahead, James. Of those of you who've watched it and like it, say something about it. James, go for it. Go ahead, Nefnor. I don't like it. I already said my piece on it. Oh, all right. So James has seen it and doesn't like it. Um, I've seen like four episodes, so I don't have anything fair to say about it. But it sounds like James and Neff really like it, so I don't know. Do you guys think it's going to be renewed? This season, this thing we linked uh, seemed to suggest it might not. I hope so. It is, it is I, would say, I would say that if it gets renewed, it will be a last-minute thing. And, you know, 
it really jo- it is John Constantine. Uh, there's a quote at the very end of the first episode. He's like, you know, he steps it steps on the shadows, all trench coat and arrogance. He faces the demons and kicks them in the bollocks. And he does he 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 does his work alone because, let's face it, who'd be crazy enough to do it with him? And that it, that describes the character very well. And speaking of uh, Rachel's comment earlier, Grim Grim has been renewed for season five. And I there's another show I don't know anything about. I haven't seen oh, it. there, there's so there's so many things going on. It's it's got a lot of stuff that I I feel that I could that I really want from a supernatural show, uh, and uh, I don't know, it, man, with the world building, it somehow makes things feel believable. It has its own it has its own rules. Basically, the first thing you need to understand about the show, and this is just short short version, you've got the main character, um, God. Why, 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 is, why is my brain fried? Anyway, the main character, he is a Grim, which is basically, he comes from a long line of them. They're monster hunters. They can see uh, another side of human beings, which, which some, some of them... Nefinor, you explain better. My brain is... is okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, basically, there are two races of uh, beings on planet Earth. There is humans, and there is... Uh, Vesson. Oh, Vesson. God. Vesson. And Vesson are... Basically, the source of all super uh, supernatural things, like for example, El Chupacabra, uh, Big Bad Wolf, all of these things are basically Vesson that somebody has seen at some point, and so they explain it as some kind of uh, fairy tale or some story. And as such, he hunts them down when they're bad. Well, in this case, he's decided to hunt them down when they're bad because he's a cop, and help those who are good because there are some good ones out there, and. It's taking all of the lore and mythology from pretty much every culture out there and changing it in its own way to fit with modern times in a way that actually works. And they've got political intrigue going on. They've got racial purity things going on. They've got all sorts of different plot lines all intertwined in it. And it's all in this quite believable world. Yeah, there would be a lot of ways to fuck this up, but they managed to continue to pull it off in a way that is believable and well developed, I think. That's just oh, I'm hearing two positive votes for that. Um, in a lot of ways, it's not so much a supernatural drama as it is a character drama set in the supernatural world. Yeah, and a lot of it is, um, at least uh, in the first couple seasons, from what I understand, uh, and I, I'm already in this, I think, season three, so uh, what happens is, is they actually sort of uh, reimagine fairy tales in a way that are very believable. So it's it's a uh, and, and like I said, uh, the, it's more the darker version, not the watered down version. So there's a lot of dark shit going on in there. Well, I will say that my father is a huge fan of the show. I've seen a few episodes, and from what I've seen, it is really good. I just don't have time to watch it. Mm-hmm. But it uh, is definitely. Worth a watch, yeah. But not as good as Constantine, in my opinion. I can relate to that. So I know we're running short on time. We all we do have to close out the show pretty soon. Gotham, motherfuckers. I, oh, Gotham has been great, but I want to ask which of you motherfuckers took my goddamn advice and checked out Black Mirror. Ah, oh, fuck! I forgot again. That is actually been awesome. awesome. You're fired. You're, fr- you're fired, you're fired, fired. Black, Black Mirror is awesome. <laughs> Black Mirror is awesome, isn't it? I I was watching it. I got caught up in catching up in Walking Dead because some people were saying we were going to talk about Walking Dead this whole show, and last minute we changed course. Yeah, zombies are dead. We will be talking about Walking Dead next show because then the season premiere, which is tomorrow, will have aired and there will have been a couple of episodes and that will be the best time to start talking. And Paul Elam says he wants to join us for that. So I'm just, I can't wait to catch up uh, and see what happens next because Walking Dead had nearly lost me. The and patriarchal overlord is coming in next show. Got it. Yep. 
So, all right, Nefinor, at least, you checked out Black Mirror, and, and, and Christian, I know you checked out Black Mirror. I checked it out you, as well. You just didn't see it all, right? I just haven't seen it all, yes. Uh, okay. What's your favorite episode, Christian? Honestly, my favorite episode is uh, episode two of season one with Bing. Um, oh, that's right. We talked about that last episode. Here. Oh, man, I love that episode. I actually finally did get around to watching uh, the White Christmas episode. Very disturbing. It's hard to see, though, because they haven't distributed that in North America yet, so you got to find some streaming service or something. That'll... It's on YouTube. That's oh, where I it? watched it. The full oh, okay. episode is up on YouTube. That's where I watched it. It's probably the one people... The, that Christmas episode was 90 minutes long. It's the longest they've ever done, and I found it deeply disturbing. I think Christian found it hard to believe. Um, but other than that, what was your favorite episode, Neff? Actually, I kind of liked the Waldo moment. The Waldo moment was really good. And I didn't quite under, even understand the Waldo moment until I, I like had to think about it. I wasn't even sure I liked the Waldo moment episode until like the day after, and then I decided I really liked it a lot. Because my take on the Waldo moment was, and it's not the same as everybody else, my take on the Waldo moment was uh, the Waldo cartoon character was ultimately making people more apathetic about politics, not less. So he wasn't really shaking up the system. He was making the system stronger by making people refuse to take politics seriously. That was and he was becoming part of the moment. system at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, because in the Waldo moment, he starts out challenging the political establishment and challenging the narrative, and then he just becomes it. And... and, and uh, it's a great episode. It's a great episode. I was actually scratching my head after I watched it and said, what? what? What was the point of that? And then I decided I really liked it. Yeah, it, it was good. I, I just looked at it, and I agree with you. It, it is basically how sometimes those who seem to be bucking the system end up becoming the system. And I think, in a way, we've already seen that because feminism has done that. Yeah, no lie. And I'll just say... I can't. You can't talk about White Bear without spoilers, but I will just say White Bear is probably my favorite because I once had a nightmare just like that, where basically I was, was that girl. And it was just weird. I mean, I wasn't a girl in the dream, but, you know, basically, <laughs> basically the girl. That, I woke, that I woke up so thinking up. I woke up thinking something like that had happened to me. It was so freaky. Uh, was, I'm going to say this, know. though. White Bear introduces one hell of a form of punishment. It does. It sure um, I, I want to know what Jim's favorite episode is so far. I know he hasn't seen all of it, but so far, Jim, what's your favorite episode? I would have to go with uh, season one, episode two, with Bing. That, and I, I've been noticing an overarching uh, theme in a lot of this is it really shows the humanity of people. And how certain things can flip. Uh, even the first episode, you know, uh, the the prime minister is doing everything he can to save save the princess, but you know, just some bad decisions from his cabinet create the situation that forces him to give in. Yeah, I've always thought that was the weakest episode, but it was still it still fucked with my head. It still yeah. fucked with my head. And I think all of them do. I mean, at some point you have to look at this and and say, "Hey, this is how our society does really work." Uh, or with could. Being, well, no, it, if you look at it, Dean, this is how our society okay. works. Not just being you. You look at uh, the first one. You look at the third one. We sit there and we overanalyze certain things. We underanalyze other things. We don't take everything together. Uh, this is actually why the show is called Black Mirror, you know. Yeah, it, 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 it's looking at humanity and society through and a very... Ourselves. Yeah, and ourselves through a very dark mirror. That uh, and also, I'm going to say this, not just a dark mirror, but uh, based on the uh, intro, a cracked mirror. I wouldn't even go with a cracked mirror. I would go with a really dark mirror and looking at the dark side of humanity because 
I haven't seen anything that's distorted. I've seen what actually happens with people. Because at the end of uh, the first episode, you know, he 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 the the prime minister actually goes through with it to save someone else's life. For lack of a better way of putting it, he would be considered a hero. He sacrifices himself to save someone else. And yet his heroism leaves him humiliated for life. Well, I wouldn't even go that it leaves him humiliated for life. Look at what his wife did, did to him. Well, I know. I know. It it's left like, him destroyed, not it left humiliated. Him complete, he left him psychologically destroyed. He psychologically destroyed himself, which is like he's a hero and he can't even bask in that. But at the same time, it also says something about political families, and it actually reminds me a lot of how the characters uh, interact in House of Cards uh, with uh, Kevin Spacey. If you haven't seen that show, go ahead and check it out. I personally love it. Um, even though he went through with it, on the outside, during interviews, when he's making public appearances, his wife still outwardly projects an image that she still loves him and... They're happy, but as soon as the doors close behind them, she's like, get the fuck away from me. I want nothing to do with you. And that's somewhat, that's kind of how political families work. I, I, I guess I'll just say it again for those of you who haven't seen it, streaming on Netflix. This is classic real science fiction, the kind that makes you think and go, this could really happen. And this is not happy. <laughs> This is not happy Star Trek land. This is very disturbing shit. Um, you could live this. This could happen. It's so cool. It's so I would cool. say it's a lot of people her. do live it. In some ways. In some ways. Um, so there you go. Shit, we're running out of time, and Rachel wants to talk about Gotham. Do we have time? No. No, we don't no. have time. Oh, well. Too bad. Um, Gotham rules. Everybody should be watching it, so there. Um, I finally caught up with it. Oh, good. Well, yeah, I hope awesome. you've been enjoying it. I hope oh, you've been so enjoying it. it is time for final thoughts. Final Chris thoughts time. Yeah, <laughs> Christian, since you're you were late, you get to go first. Uh, my only real final thought is, we need a schism in the geek community. Like, we need to say, fuck the social justice warriors. Fuck them. Fuck them. Fuck them. We'll do our own thing. We could pull it off. We did it before. I mean, shit, gaming started out because we started our own culture and we said, fuck the mainstream. We could do it again. And we need to. That's my mm -hmm. final thought. All right. Uh, Rachel, since you spoke up, you're up next. Got some rules. That is all. Okay. And watch Dean? my room. Me? Uh, Gotham does rule, and uh, check out White Mirror, Rachel, or I will punish you. And uh, you mean Black Mirror? Mirror, Dark Mirror, Black Mirror, Black Mirror, Black Mirror, Black Mirror, and uh, otherwise, uh, uh, Gotham rules. All right, Nefanor. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, the most important thing in life is remembering what day it is, Christian, and uh, <laughs> enjoy yourself. <laughs> James, do you have anything for us? No, nothing to add. <laughs> All right, I have two things. Number one, watch Constantine. Give it the give it a shot. Go through the whole se season. It is definitely worth it and disturbing. And of course, take the red pill. <laughs>